I have divided my uh, talk um, into three subcategories. Uh, one is, um, first one is classification. That means I'll be talking about uh, how we divide uh, dementia into um, a basis on the rate of progression, slow progressive as well as the rapid progressive. Second will be case series. There are five interesting cases I'll be discussing and we will be learning more about how these dementia syndromes will be presented and how we can actually investigate and uh, come to a uh, proper diagnosis. Then in the end, I'll be discussing about conventional treatments as well as the latest treatment update. So uh, first of all, classification. So there are many ways to classify dementia, but I have decided that why not rate of progression? So slowly progressive dementia, that means when the timing from onset of symptoms to the progressive progression of the symptoms is somewhere more than six months, one year, or maybe few years, that's called slowly progressive. And there are many types of dementia I have put there. There are many kinds of dementia syndrome I'll be discussing later. Second one is rapidly progressive. Uh, if the rate of progression is weeks to months, then we uh, group them under rapidly progressive. Okay, So let's talk about slowly progressive first. Now slowly progressive, there are many uh, uh, topics, uh, many types of dementia you can see here. The first one, the commonest one is Alzheimer's dementia, which at least 60% or 70% of almost all your dementia syndrome comes under uh, Alzheimer's disease spectrum. Second one is semantic dementia. People also call it as a semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia. Then next one is non-fluent aphasia. That's also a variant of uh, primary progressive aphasia. Corticobasal syndrome or corticobasal degeneration is another type where you have cortex atrophy as well as basal ganglia atrophy together with dementia syndrome. Then you have the uh, quite famous one which is behavioral variant of uh, frontotemporal dementia. We call this as BVFTD and later I'll be discussing a case about that as well. Vascular dementia as we know that in Asia uh, small vessel disease risk is quite high and due to these risks there can be um, cognitive decline as well and vascular dementia has the same pathophysiology as well. Mm -hmm. The next one is normal pressure hydrocephalus which has classical triad of urinary incontinence, cognitive decline as well as uh, symptoms of gait issues. So all these three are comes under when the ventricular enlarge and this condition is called ventriculomegaly. So we have to come to a diagnosis of ventriculomegaly whether is it just a normal pressure hydrocephalus or is it something else. So we have to do a proper investigation for that. Treatment for NPH or normal pressure hydrocephalus is a shunting procedure either a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or a lumboperitoneal shunt. Now the last two are dementia with Levy body or Parkinson disease associated dementia. Now, both of these have similar features. I'll say that Parkinson's disease has Parkinsonism symptoms like bradykinesia, rigidity, tremor. And later on, when you start on therapy, they respond uh, um, to the medication. After a few years, we see that the disease progress. The Parkinson's disease also associated with dementia syndrome. But in Levy body dementia, Parkinsonism, even visual hallucination, as well as cognitive decline comes nearly at the same similar time. So a proper history is very important to differentiate whether the visual hallucination started before or with Parkinsonism symptom or after initiation of therapy like Medopa or Levodopa. Next one is uh, rapidly progressive dementia. Now this is very interesting as well as very important because early treatment means early investigation, early diagnosis means uh, good treatment and better outcome. So here the most commonest one is prions disease or we call this as CJD. Okay. Second one is infective causes due to viral infection of the central nervous system or bacterial or fungal. It can uh, cause cognitive decline and one must definitely investigate and treat it effectively and early too. Third one, when the immune system go faulty, autoimmune related encephalitis associated with cognitive decline or dementia features. Last one is cancer or malignancy associated, which is grouped under paraneoplastic encephalitis. Now I'll be discussing about these uh, frequencies of uh, uh, these dementia syndromes. So if you see that the major chunk of this pie chart is actually the red color, which is Alzheimer's disease, which comprises 60 to 70 percent of all the dementia syndrome, followed by uh, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, as well as Levy body dementia. So the commonest type of dementia or the most prevalent type of dementia is still Alzheimer's dementia. And now we'll be discussing the five interesting cases. So I'll start. First case, 
is about, and all these are real cases, the first case is about a middle-aged right-handed man presented with behavioral changes and cognitive decline for three years. So that means there is a slowly progressive dementia type. He had six years of education and worked as electrician. So he was doing his work very well. Now he started to have functional decline at work uh, from last few years and then it was slowly progressive as well. He failed to deliver goods to the customer but faked customer's signatures without any remorse. He passed urine on ground and uh, during the family worship time. He also passed urine on public elevator. When confronted, he showed no emotions or any disturbances. So these are called social disinhibition symptoms and classical feature of frontal lobe atrophy or frontal lobe lesions. So this behavioral syndrome we have to classify. That means there is a social disinhibition symptom in this case. Now the next slide, which shows that he also had last time interest in playing mahjong and also like buying 4D lottery. But when asked for reasons, he only smiled and replied, said that I don't feel like doing so. During conversation, he tended to say, don't know most of the time. So this is like apathy. That means he is not interested in taking part of uh, many, uh, any kind of work, any new work, or even in his previous hobbies, he is not interested. So with social disinhibition, he has apathy as well. Now, once he was involved in a road traffic accident and the motorcyclists were injured badly, he was bleeding, but he didn't show any um, uh, sympathy or any empathy towards the, the cyclist. So basically, lack of sympathy, lack of of empathy also another feature so when we have these kind of symptoms or features then we always worried about a typical type of dementia syndrome which I'll be discussing later but we investigated this case and we did an MRI brain so first uh, image is an MRI brain where you can see that there is bilateral frontal lobe atrophy followed by temporal lobe there's a little bit of atrophy at the temporal lobe FDG pad the next image is the FDG pad and we found that there's a hypometabolism at bilateral frontal lobe area so with bilateral frontal lobe and little bit of temporal lobe atrophy features of behavioral changes the diagnosis for this patient was behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia now I won't be discussing about the treatment at this point but when I finish all the cases I'll be discussing treatment in general next case this case is also very interesting. 65-year-old gentleman, he presented with complaints of cognitive impairment for past four to five years. So he presented very late, actually. His main complaint is difficulty or understanding the words during conversation, difficulty in reading Chinese words. Now, he was a Chinese scholar. He completed his education in Chinese mainstream. He was very competent in reading and writing, but he failed, completely lost the ability to read and write the Chinese character for the past two years. He also was strongly interested last time in politics, music, and frequent discussion among the social groups. But later on, we realized that the history says that he was not interested in those things as well. We examined him and what the examination showed. Bedside examination, the language examination showed he is very fluent in speech. No evidence of any grammatical error. Motor speech disorder was fine. He was only able to name five out of 15 items in the modified Boston naming list, which is actually the English words. He named dog for camel. He was also not able to comprehend simple words like calm, Caesar, and camel. When showed with 48 common Chinese characters, he failed to recognize very common words like chong, which is for warm, or e, which is cloth. And he couldn't name those and couldn't understand what is written there. So there's a significant word finding difficulty or understanding the word. So here is language is the main feature. Now, when we investigated this case, we also did some uh, visual, uh, whether he can recognize the uh, pictures which he was interested last time. So we showed him pictures of Mr. LKY or Stephanie Soon, and he couldn't recognize them as well. So this condition is uh, called prosognosia, where you have uh, where the images which you actually discussed or known clearly last time, now we couldn't able to uh, name them. So basically, cannot read the face, and what is the uh, context behind this face also he couldn't tell us. So when we investigated, we did an MRI for him we found that he has a bilateral anterior temporal lobe atrophy. And with the features of commonly, which is word finding difficulty, prosopagnosia, the diagnosis is semantic dementia, or we can say semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia. So these are the two features of slowly progressive. Now I'll be discussing two cases of rapidly progressive dementia. This case is a 40 year old gentleman personality change for three months, only three months, okay? He has impulse buying. He has a grandiose thinking that he is a great singer and he always involved in uh, small gatherings and try to sing and try to impress public. And he was, he has a thinking that he has very beautiful voice. He 
as very energetic all the time, poor insight whenever, when we, whenever the question was that, why you're singing, he always had poor insight, no hallucination. He lost his job also because he couldn't concentrate in the work. Then the neurologic examination shows euphoric mood. He was always euphoric, high energy. He gave even high five to the neurologist who first assessed him. Neurobehavioral examination showed impaired working memory. The MRI brain didn't show any abnormality. No atrophy was seen clearly. Then we did a CSF test, lumbar puncture. We found that there's a raised white cell count and protein, suggestive of a sign of infection. We did a CSF VDRL as well as the serum VDRL, which was positive, and it was mostly pointing towards a diagnosis of neurosyphilis. So diagnosis for this patient is neurosyphilis, which is general paralysis of insane. We started him on treatment for syphilis, but unfortunately it was already a complicated tertiary stage where the cognitive functions didn't improve. So early diagnosis of these condition can definitely get better results. That's the message from this case. Next case, which is also a rapidly progressive uh, dementia case, um, Next. Next case is a 65-year-old Chinese male, cashier by occupation. He was working fine, but last two-month history, he has a memory problem, couldn't plan things, couldn't even handle his work, so he lost his job. He cannot perform as cashier. Then, um, when we did the cognitive exam, there was a screening test for the memory, which, is, which he scored only 5 out of 30. That means significant memory impairment in all of all his domains. Neurological examination shows apraxia. That means the learned motor activities he lost. Like when we ask him to brush his teeth or comb hair, he couldn't do that. Also has myoclonic jerks. Patient become bed bound in last few months. Investigations, blood tests didn't reveal any abnormality. Then we did MRI brain for him. And the MRI showed very classic picture of cortical ribboning. That means in the cortex, in the main lobes of the brain, there was cytotoxic edema or damage. And the etiology is still uncertain. We did an EEG for him. That also shows a pathognomic feature of uh, tip, uh, disease, which I'll tell you later. But the EEG shows periodic discharges at frequency of 1 hertz. So basically, he has cortical ribboning. He has a classic EEG features, rapidly progressive dementia. We did CSF and examination for him. And the initial investigation for bacteria, virus, everything negative. But CSF 1433 protein was positive, And thus, the diagnosis of CJD, or prions disease, was made. Now, CJD is a prototype of rapidly progressive dementia. Whenever there's a patient of rapidly progressive dementia of of uh, middle age especially, that the diagnosis of CJD should be considered or ruled out. Another, apart from 1433, another uh, investigation which can confirm uh, the diagnosis is RT quick, which is real-time quacking induced conversion. Now the picture here is uh, from Kuru tribe, where this disease was uh, known last time, and it was known as Kuru disease also. In this tribe, there is a uh, there, there, there are a few funeral rites where they usually, or the whole tribe will uh, eat the dead person's brain, and that's why the disease will transmit. That's why this Kuru disease was very prevalent in the region. Later on, uh, even in today's world, the CGD can be transmitted by iatrogenic induced uh, causes as well, like corneal transplant if this infected, contaminated EG electrode. Last time there were invasive EG electrodes were used, so chances of infection is much higher. Dural grafts or human growth hormones can also transmit this disease. So one should be very careful when we uh, do all these uh, transplant or grafts. Now, yeah. so now I'm going, moving to the fifth case, which is a very classic case of dementia, and I kept it purposely in the end. So we have discussed the slowly progressive and rapidly progressive. Now we're discussing about case five, which is a common normal dementia, and I'll tell you what is the diagnosis later. 57-year-old male presented with one year of onset of cognitive decline. So one year history, that means it's a slow progressive. He unable to perform his job as tailor. He unable to calculate, so there was a calculator or dyscalculia. Confused with task, that means cannot plan things. So there's executive dysfunctions also. Forgetfulness, personal items, conversation, he couldn't recognize, couldn't remember things. So there's an amnestic episode as well. He has word finding difficulty like anomia, which we call. So he had all the features which fits into a typical uh, dementia syndrome. When we examine him, uh, the examination showed, next. So on examination, the memory screening test shows MMSE. Minimum mental state shows 26 out of 30, which is borderline. His B12 folate, VDRL were normal. Thyroid tests were normal. 
Few years ago, there was an EEG and MRI done for some other reason were also reported normal. But now, after a few years, when we did um, uh, the MRI, uh, which actually shows that there is bilateral temporal lobe as well as hippocampal atrophy. The neuropsychology test shows visual constriction and executive function impaired uh, test also. So that means there is memory issues, there is um, atrophy of the hippocampal, atrophy of the temporal lobe. When we uh, group all these imaging findings as well as the features, the diagnosis came as Alzheimer's. But we didn't uh, diagnose him here. We did more tests further. What are the tests we did? We did an FDG PET to actually confirm. So FDG PET shows hypometabolism at bilateral temporoparietal area. So you can see on the last two images, there's temporal lobe clearly sees there's a hypometabolism. We in fact did one more step for confirmation, which is a CSF test. When we did lumbar puncture, we ruled out there's no infection. There is no uh, bacteria, viruses, anything quite normal, but CSF amyloid beta 42 was low and CSF phosphorylated tau increased. So amyloid low, tau increase, this is also together with FDG PET and MRI features plus the history which actually ruled out other causes, the patients diagnosed as in the end as Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So these are the five cases where I discussed slowly progressive and rapidly progressive. Now I'd like to touch on the treatment part. Since many years, the treatment of dementia, we have not many medication, but we have uh, medication lists like this, donepezil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. These are, anti uh, these are cholinergic medication or anti acetylcholinesterase uh, medication or acetylcholinesterase inhibitor medication. That means they, are pro they, they make acetylcholine available to the system. And these are the main cholinergic drugs. Memantine is used for moderate to severe dementia and is an NMDA antagonist drug. So these are the four drugs we usually use. In Singapore, donepezil and rivastigmine is mostly used. Galantamine is less used. So donepezil and rivastigmine for mild moderate, memantine for severe dementia. So these are the treatment uh, we have uh, using since long time. There was no disease modifying therapy since long time. But after June last year, there's this new drug which FDA approved, which is called Eduhelm. And this drug is actually a first of, first of its own kind, that is disease modifying therapy. Now, uh, yeah, next. So disease modifying therapy, Eduhelm. So I'll talk to you a little bit about Eduhelm or what this medication can do. So Eduhelm, the other name monoclonal antibody is Aducanumab. It is administered by monthly infusions. It's very expensive drug only used for mild Alzheimer's disease or maybe MCI, that means pre-dementia state, cannot use for severe dementia. There are risk of cerebral edema, gait disturbances as well. Now, how this Eduhelm works? So basically, your beta amyloid will deposit in the brain. They form neurofibrillary tangles and cause damages. Next. So in this picture, you can see that the, the the first part of the picture shows uh, amyloid uh, forming neurofibrillary tangles and causing the nerve cells to go damaged. And then the pathophysiology behind Alzheimer's disease is this. So this monoclonal antibody will attach with this targeting amyloid deposit and will flush it out from the system. That's how it works. But it's not easy that, you know, there won't be any side effect. There will be many side effects. So we have to be very cautious. Inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, the physician should really go through very carefully. There are a few contraindications for this drug. One is if patient on anticoagulant, that means stronger blood thinner like warfarin, rivaroxaban, we shouldn't use it. History of stroke or TIA in last one year, we shouldn't be using it. Impaired renal or liver profile also, we have to avoid using this. Now I'll be discussing take home message of, from my slides. Uh, identify a rapidly progressive dementia early and treat early like infective, autoimmune, even paraneoplastic related etiologies. If you find early, we can treat early and that results in better outcome. Must diagnose dementia syndrome accurately because there are certain type of medication we can use for Alzheimer's, but they are not so useful in other types of uh, syndrome, other types of dementia variants. Now, new DMTs or new disease modifying therapy will come, we know that, and future is full of hope. That is my uh, last message. Exercise is key to prevent majority of neurodegenerative disease, so that's what we all know, so we should continue that. Thanks a lot. With future full of hope, I would like to end my